I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend His cause. Maintain the honors of His word, the glory of His cross. Hello, I'm James Brown, and on behalf of the Eastern Church of Christ located in Toronto, Canada, I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday Sermon edition of Walking Through the Bible, a podcast where we seek to study the Bible and the Bible alone. Please stick around afterwards for information on how you can contact us. But for now, we'll turn it over to Jeremy Diesel-Camp for our Sermon of the Day. If you were to ask a person on the street, what are some common indicators or marks of someone who claims to be a Christian, what kind of answers would you expect? Some might say that Christians are kind, generous, or loving, while others might say that Christians are backward, intolerant, or bigoted. Which answer you get really depends on who you ask and what their opinion of Christianity is in general. Now, if you were to ask the same question among people who call themselves Christians, what kind of answers would you expect? Would those answers be from the Bible? Or would they be like the answers from the people on the street? A matter of opinion. I suggest that the Bible does tell us what a Christian is and how we are to behave. So once a month over the next nine months, which will bring us to December, Lord willing, we'll be covering a series that uh, will be called The Marks of a Christian. This lesson will focus on the fact that a Christian is a faithful person. Now it goes without saying that a Christian needs to be a faithful person. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But that statement begs the question, What do I need to have faith in? in order to become a Christian. Well, this verse in Hebrews tells us that we must first believe in God. We must not just believe in any God, though. We must believe in the true God, the God of the Bible. In Acts 17, Acts 17, verses 24 and 25, Paul says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. When we look out into this world, we see many gods. We see the gods of the Hindus. We see the god of the Buddhists. We see the god of the Muslims. And many other gods too numerous to name. And we also have the god of the Bible. When you examine all of these gods, you soon come to a conclusion. They can't all be the true God. The reason is quite simple. Because they tell different stories of how we got here and of what God expects of us. So what makes the God of the Bible, the true God, and all of the others imposters? Well, it's because of the written word that we call the Bible. The only explanation that can account for the consistency of the Bible is that it came from the mind of God. For the scriptures were revealed over a 1500 year period to different men with different backgrounds. Every other religious book contains errors in them, whether it's in doctrine, in history, or in science. This is not true about the Bible, in spite of everything the skeptic might say. The Bible is consistent throughout, which is only possible if man did not write it. But God did. Proclaiming to people about the true God was exactly what Paul was trying to do in Athens in Acts 17. He declares, just as Genesis 1 verse 1 says, that the God of the Bible created this universe, and since he did, God is not worshipped through the making of idols. If you really sit down and think about it, God made the gold, the silver, the wood, and all the jewels that adorn idols today. So why would worshiping them glorify God? If we are being truly honest with ourselves, we realize that it wouldn't. 
We realize that God cannot be defined by his creation. He is different than his creation, and he is greater than his creation. Knowing this fact, having faith in the true God, in the true God's existence, is necessary if we want to become a Christian. But just believing that the true God exists isn't all that a person needs to have faith in. We must also have faith that the Bible is the Word of God. Many people believe that the Bible was written by men like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, Peter, and Jude. This has caused many to discount the books of the Bible as mere propaganda or literature written by religious fanatics in order to gain followers. If you watch religious television shows, especially at this time of the year, something I don't recommend, you might even come to the conclusion the Bible is filled with flaws and therefore shouldn't be believed as an authority of how to live our lives in the 21st century. But as I said earlier, the consistency of the Bible, when you read it from cover to cover, can only be explained if God wrote it. The prophecies in the Old Testament, written long before the time of Jesus, are fulfilled in the New Testament, something that even the opponents of Christianity in the first century didn't have an acceptable answer for. The science that the Bible speaks of, what we'll be talking about, the Lord willing, in our Chinese English, by a seminar on April the 29th has always shown to be accurate when science has proven something to be true. The doctrines and scriptures contained in the New Testament, written down over a period of 70 years in many different places, don't contradict each other. Salvation is by grace, as recorded by Paul in Ephesians 2 verse 8, and by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10. How could all of these things be true about the Bible if the Bible was written by men? The answer is they couldn't. In truth, the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles and teachers to write down what they wrote. And as such, we can have confidence that what we have is what we need to obey God. 2 Peter 1 verse 21 says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. If we're to have faith required to become a Christian, we must have faith that the Bible is the Word of God and obey it and it alone. Moving on though, as 2 Peter 1 verse 21 just alluded to, we also must have faith in the Holy Spirit. When it comes to the doctrine or the topic of the Holy Spirit, many people get confused because there is so much false doctrine out there. Among all of the topics discussed in the Bible, the topic of the Holy Spirit probably ranks among the top five most understood, misunderstood teachings in all the Bible. And while we're not going to have time to discuss all of the aspects of the Holy Spirit this morning, we can't even really do that in one sermon, let alone in five minutes, let's recognize that we need to know that He exists. Why? because he is involved in our salvation. We are, we've already talked about the fact that it is because of the Holy Spirit that we have the Bible today. That's why the blasphemy or total rejection of the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. Not because God can't forgive that particular sin, but because there's nobody else who will reveal God's will to us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in them? So also no, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Without the Holy Spirit, we would be lost, unable to find God. But I suggest that's not the only way the Holy Spirit is involved in our salvation. In Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, well, let's read verses 4 through 8. Titus 3, beginning at verse 4. For when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, 
by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Verse 5 says that the moment we obey God, we are renewed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, our lives are made new again by the actions of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed God's word to us. He renewed our lives and therefore made it possible for us to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is salvation, just as Acts 2.38 records for us. Without the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, we can't become a Christian. You don't have to take my word for it, though. Let's take Paul's. Turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Let's read verses 2-5. Acts 19, beginning at verse 2. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now we're going to talk more about this particular passage, Lord willing, in the next two weeks, or in the will, Lord willing, in two weeks. But for now, we need to realize that the lack of knowledge the Holy Spirit existed prevented these people from becoming Christians because the Holy Spirit is the one through whom the message of Jesus Christ is revealed to us. So in order to have faith needed to become a Christian, I must have faith in the Holy Spirit that He exists. I do not need to know everything about Him, but I need to acknowledge that He exists because He's involved in our salvation. Which brings us to the person you probably thought I'd spend the entire lesson on, Jesus. You see, you can't become a Christian without having faith in Jesus. In Acts 16, verse 31, when the Philippian jailer wanted to know what he needed to do to be saved, Paul said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Believing in Jesus is a pretty broad statement. Do I need to know everything about Jesus in order to be a Christian? No. For in the verses we just read, the Philippian jailer, a man who had never heard about Jesus before that night, that same hour believed in Jesus and obeyed him in baptism. Sometimes I feel that many people don't become a Christian because they think they don't know enough. What they feel, fail to realize is that becoming a Christian is only the first step. We must continue to grow. There are things that I didn't know when I became a Christian. There are things, that, sorry, in 10 years from now, I could look back and say the same thing. Now that doesn't mean I wasn't a Christian back then. It just, didn't, it just means I didn't have a full understanding of the gospel. So knowing that there, so knowing that, what are some basic things that I need to have faith in in order to have faith in Jesus? Well, first, we need to have faith and know that he existed and was born of a virgin. Matthew 1.18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. We've already talked about having faith in the Bible and having faith in the Holy Spirit. Well, here the Bible says that Jesus was born of a woman who had never had sex before. Biologically, we know that's impossible. But we also know that with God, everything <coughs> is possible. That's why I don't understand people who say that I believe in Jesus, yet deny this story. They believe that God is powerful enough to save anyone who believes, but not powerful enough to cause a virgin to become pregnant. What a preposterous notion. If we want to believe in Jesus, we can't pick and choose which parts to accept. We must believe it all. Second, we need to have faith in Jesus' teachings. Again, does that mean we must know everything Jesus ever said? No, 
But at its very core, Jesus taught us that he was the Son of God from heaven, a teaching we must accept, and that we need to do the will of God, the Father, who is in heaven, just as he did. He said in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. What is the will of the Father? It is for us to recognize that we're in sin, that we need to repent of our sin, and turn to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. Paul said in Acts 17, verse 30, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. It is impossible to have faith in Jesus' teachings and not know that there's a difference between right and wrong. And that standard by which we determine the rightness or wrongness of something is God's Word. It is impossible to have faith in Jesus' teachings and not see the need to repent, to change our heart towards sin. And it is impossible to have faith in Jesus' teachings and not be willing to obey Him. That means that as we learn what God's will is, someone who has faith in Christ will apply those teachings into their lives and correct anything that was wrong. A willingness to do this is what God expects of us. Next, in order to have faith in Jesus, we need to have faith that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. These doctrines are at the very foundation of the gospel. And one cannot be a Christian without them. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verses 3 and 4, For I deliver to you as of first importance which all, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. The fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again the third day is what many people are remembering today with today being Easter. It might therefore be puzzling to some in our audience or some viewing online why we don't have a special Easter service or a special Easter sermon this morning? The reason is because we don't find the early Christians celebrating Easter in order to remember Christ. Now don't get me wrong. They remembered Christ's death and resurrection. But they did that on every Sunday. Not just one Sunday a year. Luke recorded the following in Acts 20 verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. The phrase break bread in this verse means the Lord's Supper. The fact that they did this on the first day of the week is why we do that on the first day of the week. We have not done that yet, but we will later on in the service. And the fact that this Sunday, I'm sorry, and the fact that this isn't the Sunday, that the world calls Easter, for it is, least, it is at least one, if not two weeks after the Passover, shows that the early church remembers Christ, remember Christ's death more often than many so-called Christians do today. But getting back to the major point, it is important to believe that Jesus died on the cross because without the sacrifice, Hebrews 9.22 would tell us that there is no forgiveness of sins. It is just as important, though, that we believe that Jesus Christ rose again. For without that, Paul told the Corinthians, the 1 Corinthians 15, 14, that their faith, and consequently our faith, is useless. Jesus' death and his resurrection work hand in hand in removing the grip that Satan has on us by releasing us from the power of sin and death. It is also the reason we can have faith in our own resurrection. The gospel falls and Jesus fails if both of these things did not happen. So it's important that we believe in them if we want to become a Christian. Fourth, in order to have faith in Jesus, we must have faith that he is king today. Now this might seem obvious, but many still believe that Jesus is coming in the future sometime in order to establish a kingdom. A consequence of believing this is that you would have to acknowledge that Jesus isn't a king right now. 
And I'm sure people who accept this teaching, which is known as premillennialism, would deny what I just said. But a king cannot be a king without a, pe without a people to rule or to a place to rule from. The scriptures, however, clearly teach that king Christ is king now over his church, which he rules from heaven. Peter said in Acts 2, we're going to read 25 to 36, so if you want to turn in your Bibles to Acts 2, let's begin reading at verse 25. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make my enemies your, or your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This sermon is the first sermon preached following Jesus' death, the sermon that caused about 3,000 souls to be saved that day. And here you have Peter teaching them the very same things we've been talking about here this morning concerning Jesus. And he concluded that by telling them that Jesus, the one who had been crucified some seven weeks earlier, was now Christ. Christ meaning anointed one or king. And that king was sitting at the right hand of God while Peter spoke those words. Christ is not coming to set up some earthly kingdom. He's king right now. And it's something that we need to realize if we're to have faith in Jesus. Moving on quickly, in order to have faith in Jesus, we also need to have faith that God, through Jesus, is able to save us. Romans 8, verses 20 to 25 says, For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, uh, sorry, because of him who subjected it, in hope the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. These verses are an expansion of the thought that we read earlier in Hebrews 11, verse 6. In order to please God, we must not only believe in him, we must believe that he rewards them that diligently seek him. In other words, we must believe in God and we must believe God. Let's never forget that our hope saves us. Why is that? Because our hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That just as he rose again, we will rise again. Just as he ascended to heaven to be with the Father, we will one day ascend to heaven to be with the Father. When Christians lose their hope, they lose their faith and fall away from Christ. In order to be a Christian, we must have faith and the hope that God has promised us, eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And finally, in order to have faith in Jesus, we need to have faith to submit to God in the way he commanded. In the religious world, if someone asks, what must I do to be saved, they're going to get a variety of answers, the majority of which is only half the truth. The problem with that is, is half the truth won't save you. You need it all. 
We need to obey God by doing all that He says. Belief or faith in the message of Christ is an important step, but it's not the last. We must have a belief or faith that works. In James 2, verse 24 and 26, we read, You see that a, just, a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Verse 26 says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now these works that James speaks of aren't works of men that earn us salvation, but works of God that are required to obey Him. And that's what many people have a problem with, that there's anything they must do. They believe God does all the work, leaving man to do nothing but believe. Never mind the fact that Acts 2.37 is where the people ask Peter what they must do to be saved. Peter's answer wasn't nothing or that you're saved by faith alone. His response was to repent and be baptized. He said this, Peter said this, because he understood that only working faith was acceptable to God. What we must understand is that one can have faith, but not a working faith. The Bible calls that type of faith dead faith, and dead faith cannot save. However, a working faith will cause a person to repent, as Acts 2.38 says. A working faith will cause a person to confess Jesus Christ, as Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 says. And a working faith will lead one to be baptized for the remission of sins, as Acts 22.16 says. People can deny it all they want, but baptism is required for salvation, and is required in order to have faith in Jesus. To prove that, let's turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we'll read verses 30 through 38. Acts 8, beginning at verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Do you understand what you read? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shears, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray you, of whom does this prophet speak? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they both and they and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. We of course know that this is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. What I find remarkable about this story is that Philip started from the Old Testament, preached Jesus to the man, and the first question out of his mouth after hearing about Jesus was about baptism. If this man was being taught by the people you hear on the radio or see on the television or internet today, I doubt he would even bring up the topic of baptism because that topic rarely comes up. Or when it does, it is minimized. Yet here you have the human, having heard about Jesus, urgently talking about baptism. That tells me that part of having faith in Jesus requires us to believe in baptism for the remission of sins and not only to believe in it, but to be baptized ourselves. The reason for the, for the eunuch's urgency? Because he would have learned that baptism is the point that, like Romans 6, verses 3 and 4 says, that we're buried with Christ and that we're raised to walk in newness of life. It is at that point that Acts 22, 16 says that our sins are forgiven. The eunuch wanted his sins forgiven. Right then and there, so he was baptized the very moment he confessed his faith in Jesus. Today, if you haven't been baptized with Christ's baptism, the baptism that remits sins, you might think you're a Christian, but the Bible says that you are not. 
having faith in Jesus is doing what Jesus says in the way that he says it. So in conclusion, in order to become a Christian, we must have faith in God. We must have faith in the Bible. We must have faith in the Holy Spirit. And we must have faith in Jesus. And we must have a faith, a working faith, a faith that obeys. Becoming a Christian, though, isn't the last step that we take towards God. It's the first step we take as babes in Christ, new children of God. For God doesn't expect us to remain babes forever. He expects us to grow. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Growing in Christ is a lifelong journey that will require us to study God's Word and to continue to add to our faith the things found therein. Thank you, Jeremy. And for our viewers, we also thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button below. Should you have any questions or comments, please leave a comment below or email us at answerintheword at gmail.com. We'll try to respond to you as quickly as we can. We hope you'll also view today's question and answer edition, which can be found on our YouTube channel on the Walking Through the Bible 2018 question and answer edition playlist. Please also join us, Lord's willing, tomorrow when we will be continuing our study of the book of Genesis. Goodbye for now, and have a great day. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor